And now on BBC One, who owns Leeds United? An Inside Out special presented by David Conn. There's been a football club in Leeds for over a century, but it's the recent history of Leeds United that has set the club at odds with its fans and drawn serious criticism in Parliament. Calling Leeds United fans morons, um, you know, dissidents, these type of things. It's not a very nice way to talk to the, the fans. We want our club back! I think people find it incredible that Ken Bates had no knowledge of who the owners of the club were. Tax havens are not just about tax. In fact, the name is misleading. The real benefit they provide to their clients is secrecy. The president can move, the owner can move, the coach can move, the players they can move, but who will stay always in the, in the stands, in the stadium, are the fans. I'm David Conn, I'm an investigative sports writer for the Guardian newspaper. For six years, Leeds United was administered by a company here in Switzerland on behalf of owners who were never identified. Then in May this year, Ken Bates bought the club via a company based in a tax haven. But does that decision to suddenly buy Leeds United after six years raise more questions than it answers? Well, it's the heart of the community, it's, it is the heart of the city for many people. You know, the city always feels happier when the football club's doing well and it's nice to think that it's doing it in a decent way and, a, and in a way that other people can look at and admire it. It's generally accepted that the Peter Ridsdale era was financially disastrous for Leeds. Champions League semi-finalists of 2001, two years later the club had crippling debts. Should we have spent so heavily in the past? Probably not. But we lived the dream. A group of local businessmen known as the Yorkshire Consortium took over at Elland Road in March 2004. They were led by an insolvency expert, Gerald Krasner. As far as I was concerned, this was a labour of love. Normally I charge a lot of money for this work. Believe it or not, this was done for nothing. Our primary aim was to financially stabilise the club because if we didn't do that, uh, effectively the club was finished. Two months later, the consortium's hopes of turning the financial situation around were in tatters. United were relegated from the Premier League. Yeah, it's a disappointing day for everybody connected with the club. Krasner's consortium now had to sell many of the club's assets to try to balance the books. That meant players, the training ground at Thorpe Arch and even Elland Road itself. By the start of 2005, the Yorkshire consortium wanted out. Despite their efforts to stabilise the club's financial position, they hadn't been able to cut the club's debts down to manageable levels. Then, just at their darkest hour, an unlikely guardian angel arrived from the tax haven of Monaco. Ken Bates was born in London in 1931. Brought up by his grandparents on a council estate, Bates made his money wheeling and dealing. He dabbled in ready-mix concrete, property and banking. He also invested in football. Oldham Athletic in the 1960s and then three decades ago, he bought one of London's most glamorous clubs. Chelsea were almost bankrupt in 1982 when Ken Bates bought the club, famously for just one pound. In the two decades he was here, he built Chelsea into one of England's most glamorous and successful clubs, while always caught in controversy. Bates' position, uh, vis-a-vis Leeds, uh, they thought he was the, the living saviour, uh, and that is how he presented himself. He did the same at Chelsea, he's done it in all sorts of places. He's the man who comes when death is standing at the door uh, and promises uh, to breathe new life into the corpse. But by 2003, Ken Bates' success at Chelsea was threatened by £80 million of debt. Good evening. The biggest takeover in English football has been agreed tonight. Just as things looked bleak for Ken Bates, he pulled off an astounding business coup, selling the club in the summer of 2003 to the Russian oligarch, Roman Abramovich. 
For the Chelsea shares that he had paid just £1 for, Ken Bates was paid £17 million. A number of other unidentified shareholders based in various offshore tax havens also sold out to the Russian at the same time. Bates retired to his flat in the tax haven of Monaco. He seemed to have walked away from English football forever. But football was in Ken Bates' blood. And out of the blue, in January 2005, he flew into Yorkshire. Once more, all eyes are on Leeds United. Tonight, just a week after denying any interest in the club, Ken Bates looks set to take control at Ellen Road. And I promise the Leeds fans, uh, you still a Blacks fans, we're going to have a long, long laugh. With Krasner's consortium wanting out of Leeds United, a deal with Bates was quickly agreed. Bates paid them almost nothing, but promised to settle the club's most urgent tax bill. We had taken it as far as we could. We had no further monies to put in. We were not rich men. We were people who would put time and effort in. And we took a view that if Leeds United was to move forward, it needed new investment. We thought that the Krasner board had got out of its depth, despite their best efforts. Um, there was a fear of out of the frying pan into a different fire. But had Bates' apparent success at Chelsea blinded the Yorkshire Consortium to his colourful financial history? I don't think Ken Bates is a man who's much to be proud of his reign at Chelsea. Although he rescued the club from bankruptcy, he sold it when it was pretty bankrupt too, so that's not a great achievement. In the meantime, of course, he redeveloped the ground and earned a lot of money for himself from it. But I don't think that selling it to a Russian oligarch was a great service to the fans. The headlines suggested that Bates had personally taken over Leeds, but in fact Bates only claimed to be the UK representative of a company based in the Cayman Islands, a Caribbean tax haven. This company, called Forward Sports Fund, or FSF, was established for the sole purpose of buying Leeds. To further complicate matters, FSF was managed by a Swiss company called Chateau Fiduciaire. Chateau Fiduciaire has always refused to reveal the identity of the owner or owners of Leeds United. We're dealing with someone who is resident offshore, let's say in somewhere like Monaco, and they set up their company, the ownership of their company through offshore structures. Then they're in a position basically to not pay tax on anything, above all on capital gains. Now capital gains arise when you sell a company for a profit. So although FSF owned Leeds United from 2005, Nobody had a clue who owned FSF. Many believed Ken Bates had to be the owner, but he has always maintained he wasn't. Oh, uh, who are they? Uh, the one condition they made of coming in was they did not want any publicity or their identity being disclosed because they've seen what happened in football. When it later transpired that he had no involvement, no money in it, and in fact, didn't even know who he was working for, who the ultimate owners were. Um, I was incredulous. But Mr Bates, in my opinion, is not somebody who would work for an unknown person. Leeds United, the Yorkshire club, was administered from here, the Rue de Rhone in Geneva, Switzerland. On the fifth floor of this building is Chateau Fiduciaire, which represented FSF, operating under strict Swiss secrecy laws, legally obliging it not to reveal the identity of its clients. Since the 60s, Bates has developed the habit of working with companies based offshore. But what are the benefits of working through tax havens? Tax havens are not just about tax. In fact, the name is misleading. Uh, professionally, we call them secrecy jurisdictions because the real benefit they provide to their clients is secrecy. As a football fan, it's important to me that I know who owns my club. And the trouble is when you have a structure which is set up in a tax haven and you don't really know who's behind that, inevitably you can start worrying about, is this club being ripped off? Is there money laundering behind this club? Is there, are there any other kind of bad activities which we don't know because we can't find out who actually owns this club? After the takeover, FSF injected around £4.5 million into Leeds to pay off the club's most urgent debts. 
and in Bates' first full season in charge, Leeds came oh so close to returning to the riches of the Premier League. They reached the playoff final under manager Kevin Blackwell. Within 18 months to take it round, to walk out at Cardiff in front of 60,000 Leeds fans who are just different class as supporters was maybe the most proudest day of my career. That defeat had huge financial consequences. With no more parachute payments from the Premier League, Leeds' income fell dramatically and over the summer, more players were sold at Elland Road. Soon afterwards, Blackwell was sacked and replaced by Dennis Wise. But by the spring of 2007, things looked bleak on the pitch and in the boardroom. The club tried to borrow £25 million from Leeds City Council to buy back Elland Road and Thorpe Arch. But the deal collapsed, partly because the club refused to reveal the identity of the owners of FSF. We regard, actually, the present management at Leeds United to be running a very tight ship uh, and uh, a great deal tighter than a number of other football clubs. Uh, nevertheless, in 2007, we wanted absolute crystal clear uh, information and that was not forthcoming. At the time, we were uh, unable to ascertain, despite asking very pointed questions, either who owned the ground or who owned the football club. The decision not to lend any money to Leeds United would prove to be a very wise one for the council. A few weeks later, in April 2007, the club's already precarious financial predicament worsened substantially. A late Ipswich equaliser meant that Leeds United were relegated to the third tier of English football for the first time in the club's history. Relegation was a huge financial blow. Just two and a half years after Ken Bates took over Leeds, the club was effectively bust. The club had debts of over £35 million, much of it owed to businesses and organisations across the region. West Yorkshire Police were owed £80,000. Leeds Metropolitan University was owed £46,000 and many small businesses also lost money, including this family-run bakery in North Leeds. £3,000, it doesn't sound a lot of money in the big scheme of things, but you know, when rolls are a very small unit price, you've got to make a lot of rolls to make £2,500. And how would you describe overall the impact on your business and did it take you some time to recover? Well, it did, because we, we still got to pay our suppliers. The accountancy firm KPMG tried to organise a deal whereby at least three quarters of the creditors of Leeds would agree to accept less than they were owed. Bates's first offer was just a penny for every pound owing. And the taxman, who was asking for over £7 million back, threatened to go to court. Leeds were in danger of going out of business completely. We were staring into the abyss. It was a, it was a scary time, thinking that there could be no more Leeds. In English football, when a club goes bust, the rules say that any money it owes to players or to other clubs have to be paid in full. But the other people to whom a club owes money, which can be small businesses, charities and public bodies, and the tax authorities, they have to wait in line for a fraction of what they're owed. I must admit that the football creditors rule was something I'd heard of, but I didn't really understand the reality of, of how it was used um, until we started getting into this committee. And I was really appalled by, by what I found. All football creditors must be paid in full. And a football creditor is any other football club owed money or any footballer owed wages or transfer money. Incidentally, a football manager is not a football creditor. The former manager, Kevin Blackwell, was the club's biggest non-football creditor. He was owed almost £1 million by Leeds. Of the rest of Leeds' debt, £8 million was owed to the football creditors. Of what remained, around half was owed to two obscure offshore companies called Astor Investment Holdings and Crato. These two trusts had apparently lent Leeds United almost £15 million over the previous 18 months. Ken Bates, and his legal representatives denied having any connection to them whatsoever. But just who were these companies? Astor was registered in the British Virgin Islands and Crato in nearby Nevis. Both are tax havens and that means the names of the owners remain a closely guarded secret. KPMG now put Leeds up for sale through a very unusual auction process. 
The winner would be the bidder who offered to pay off the highest percentage of the creditors' losses. But oddly, Asta, Crato and FSF agreed to waive their combined debts of £18 million, but only if FSF were the winners of the auction. It's something I've not come across before. You know, somebody loses £18 million, that's Asta, Crato and Forward Sports between them, and then insist that the person who has lost them that money be allowed to buy the club back and that if not they will vote against it. Um, it to my mind they were associated. I've not yet seen how the association which is in the accounts I have here was ever broken. So just to repeat, the investors who'd lost a staggering £18 million under Ken Bates still insisted that he remain in charge. FSF, which had owned Leeds before they went bust, now bought back a debt-free club for under £2 million. Bates, who was only the UK representative of FSF, with no personal money invested, was back at Elland Road. And while the high-earning players were all paid in full, the non-football creditors, such as Russell's Patisserie, received only a few pence for every pound they were owed. We were owed in the region of £2,700. Uh, in total, we got back uh, a cheque for just under £50, which I think was two pence in the pound. Ken Bates has always denied that before May of this year, he was the owner of Leeds United. Not everyone believes him. There can be few people in football who privately do not believe that Ken Bates has effectively been in control of the club for most of the last six years. The answers given by the club to questions about its ownership over that period stretch credibility to say the least. Damien Collins is a member of the Culture, Media and Sports Committee of the House of Commons. The committee has been investigating football governance, with Leeds United's opaque ownership featuring heavily. Ken Bates thinks that the issue of who owns Leeds and who owns football clubs is an obsession of a few journalists and a few politicians. And he's completely wrong, because fans really do want to know who owns their clubs. When something goes wrong in a football club, uh, and that football club loses money, that club goes into administration, it's the fans that lose out by seeing their team fall through the leagues. It's the local businesses that trade with that club that lose out when it goes into administration and they get virtually nothing for the money that they're owed. And it's always the money men, people like Ken Bates, who walk away uh, and they're always protected and they live to fight another day. In a court case brought by Leeds in Jersey, a judge ordered Ken Bates to reveal the names of FSF's owners. Surprisingly, for a man who was the UK representative of FSF, Bates told the court that he didn't own any shares and that he had no knowledge of the identity of the company's shareholders. In a sworn affidavit to the court, Ken Bates said that only Chateau Fiduciaire, the Swiss management company, knew who the owners were of FSF and therefore of Leeds United. Chateau Fiduciaire wrote to the court saying that Ken Bates did not own shares in FSF but they declined to say who did. Three shareholders share equally the 10,000 shares in FSF, but it is not the policy of this company to release information on ultimate ownership without an appropriate court order valid in Switzerland. The most obvious person who might be able to clear up the mystery of the ownership of Leeds United is Ken Bates. By early August, the Leeds chairman had picked up on rumours that the BBC was researching this documentary. From his home in Monaco, Mr Bates called my producer, Neil Morrow. We asked him for an interview. I'm simply saying to you that we would like to do an interview with you where you get your say in response to the questions that fans have. Fans want to know who owns Leeds United. Mr Bates later sent us an email to confirm that he wouldn't be participating in the programme. In my dealings in the past with the BBC, the bloated, biased corporation, I've found them to be thoroughly untrustworthy. Not only were we refused an interview, but around the same time Leeds banned BBC reporters from attending the club's press conferences. Also in August, angry Leeds United supporters demonstrated against Ken Bates. The lack of spending on players over the summer had riled fans, while in contrast millions were being spent on corporate facilities at Elland Road. Why is Ken Bates the only person who, want, who would buy that club uh, and claiming he doesn't know who owns the club? As far as we're concerned, since 2007 when we went into administration and got 15 points, Ken Bates has been our owner. And then for this to come out a few months ago that he's now 
regain the majority share is something that us as fans had not, no idea about. Three days later, in his match programme notes, Mr Bates responded to the supporters' chance for him to leave the club. I'm unimpressed by the demonstrations of a few morons on Saturday and ain't going anywhere soon. Some fans may not like me or agree with me, but you're stuck with me. I saved your club in 2005 and 2007 when nobody else would. The rebuilding of Leeds United is a bit like sex. In an age of instant gratification, Leeds United is having a long drawn out affair with plenty of foreplay and slow arousal. I mean, how do people feel about this, the, this stuff being in the programme from the chairman of Leeds United? Well, from the feedback from, from our membership, we had, a, again, a number of emails and, uh, and, and comments along the lines of, you know, this is embarrassing, um, it's something that, that the chairman of the club should not be saying. We get this quite often because, you know, usually there's something in there that will offend somebody um, from match to match. But the, the most recent ones seem to sort of push it to a new level. So what have the people in charge of football made of what went on at Leeds? The authorities were embarrassed when Portsmouth, then in the Premier League, almost went bankrupt in February 2010. As a result, the rules governing ownership of clubs in the top division were tightened. The owners and directors of football clubs have to pass what's called a fit and proper persons test. It's designed to make sure that the people who own clubs are upstanding, they're not criminals or fraudsters, and they're proper people to be in charge of clubs. The Premier League's new test for owners and directors required them to be fit and proper people and anyone who owned 10% or more of a club had to be publicly identified. This would mean the fans could be sure who owned their clubs. The Premier League then required the Football League to implement exactly the same rules of transparency for its clubs. In March 2010, Leeds United passed the fit and proper persons test but neither the league nor the club said who actually owned Leeds United. Last summer they had to publish that information, but they said that nobody owned more than 10% of the club, and that meant that they didn't have to state who the individuals were who owned Leeds United. After three years in League One, Leeds returned to the Championship in 2010, and in their first season back, United possibly overachieved under Simon Grayson. For most of last year, Leeds were challenging for promotion to the Premier League. It's a pleasant surprise. We didn't expect to be pushing for promotion. But the Premier League was not about to allow Leeds into its elite competition unless the club revealed the identity of the owners of FSF. In April, the Premier League's position over Leeds was made very clear by its chief executive, Richard Scudamore. He was speaking to MPs on the Culture, Media and Sport Committee, who were investigating football governance and the ownership of Leeds United. From my understanding of the way our rules are written, we absolutely will require disclosure from Leeds United, which is over and beyond that that the Football League is required. Why doesn't your rules... At the next sitting of the committee, Alex Horn, the General Secretary of the Football Association, was asked if the FA knew who owned Leeds United. Well, I, um, I pressed Alex Horn on this question of did they actually know who the owners of Leeds United were? And he said that he didn't, but that within the Football Association there were people that had been told. So he suggested that maybe in terms of confidence that the Football Association had been told to give them reassurance and they were happy there were no problems you know, with the rules. Um, it became apparent pretty quickly afterwards that the FA didn't feel they could defend that position. They wanted to check the transcript of what had been said and they then wrote back to the committee to say actually they weren't aware of the identity of the investors in the FSF Trust who own Leeds United. In other words, even at the Football Association, English football's overall governing body, nobody knew who owned Leeds United. And as it turns out, nobody at the Football League knew either. Ken Bates may not speak to the BBC, but talking on Leeds United's own radio station, he was dismissive of the MP's investigation. This is supposed to be the awe-inspiring, the, the earth-shaking, fearless investigation into football generally. And the things I've heard so far don't amount to a row of beans. We asked the Football League to explain why it approved Leeds United's ownership arrangements without ever being told who the owners actually were. But nobody from the league, including the chairman, Greg Clark, was prepared to talk to us on camera. They did provide us with a brief statement. 
With regard to the ownership of Leeds United, the Football League is satisfied, based on the information submitted by the club, that it has complied with the Football League owners and directors test. Any discussions and exchanges of information between Leeds United and the Football League are on a confidential basis, as is the case with all our clubs. The president of European football's governing body, Michel Platini, believes that football clubs are a key part of a country's heritage and it's unreasonable to conceal the identity of the owners of a team. The supporters, they love their club and they have their own identity and they would know who is, uh, who is uh, the guy who will be the president of their own club. I think uh, a club is, uh, is a club now, uh, it's, a big, uh, it's a big identity, it's a big uh, monument of the story uh, of the history of uh, England and like club like Arsenal, Manchester. But if you don't know who is the owner, I say, uh, it's like if you don't know who is the owner of Buckingham. It's the same for me. Sadly for Leeds supporters, United's form on the pitch dipped badly after Easter this year. Hopes of promotion were fading away. But just at the point that the riches of the Premier League were out of the club's grasp, the anonymous owners of FSF now suddenly decided to find a buyer for the club. The new owner was Ken Bates. The man who said that he'd never put a penny of his own money into the club was now officially, for the first time, the owner of Leeds United. Typically, Bates bought FSF using an obscure company he claims to wholly own called Outro Limited, based in the tax haven of Nevis in the West Indies. We have no idea how much he paid for the club. And because it all took place offshore, thousands of miles from Leeds, the taxman won't have had a look in. As far as Ken Bates is concerned, with Outro buying the club, he's answered all questions about the ownership of Leeds United. But in July, the Culture, Media and Sports Committee published its report into football governance. It slammed Leeds United, saying there is no more blatant an example of lack of transparency. We were appalled, I think, of what had been going on, that um, a club had no known owner um, and that the football authorities were saying that they had applied their tests over ownership uh, that the people were fit and proper, there were no issues around you know, open and fair competition between clubs and they didn't know who owned Leeds United. It seemed totally inconsistent with everything they'd said. But how can the Football League be satisfied that the fans' reasonable desire to know who owns their club has been answered by Ken Bates and Leeds United? If Ken Bates didn't own Leeds United from 2005, then just who did? And why did those mystery owners suddenly sell to him in May this year in what looks like an unseemly rush? And how much did Ken Bates' outro pay for the club? Well, here's what we do know about Leeds United. Ken Bates, who's based in the tax haven of Monaco, claims to own a company that is based in the tax haven of Nevis that in turn owns the majority of Leeds United. Oh, and while we're at it, Elland Road is currently owned by a company based in the tax haven of the British Virgin Islands. A more opaque structure you could hardly find. I've been asking these questions about Leeds United for six years and it's not because I have any kind of grudge against the club. Far from it, I have a soft spot for Leeds United. But where a club is owned through a network of offshore tax havens under a cloak of anonymity, and it's left creditors and charities and public bodies high and dry, then it's legitimate to ask whether the club is justifying the loyalty, the lifelong loyalty, which the fans show for their club.